from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The World Conference theme is one in Christ. This is not just some feel-good slogan. It stresses the fundamental nature of the church. And when I say church, I'm speaking mostly about community of Christ. That's who we are and what we are about at this conference. Many of my thoughts could apply more broadly to Christianity, but I am focused on the worldwide church called Community of Christ. In secular terms, a church is a voluntary association of its members. And though technically true, the church is so much more than that. While the church has organization, it's not just another human institution. Although it has business functions, it's not merely a business. The church certainly has strong social concerns, but it's not just another social service agency. The church has congregations, facilities, and other tangible resources, but it's so much more than a collection of its visible parts. The church promotes relationships, but it's not just a religious social club. And while the church endeavors to meet personal needs, it's never just about satisfying individual desires. The church is much, much more than all of that. The church is a body unlike any other. The church is koinonia, a Greek word sometimes used in the New Testament to speak of the church. There's no specific English word that expresses the full meaning of koinonia. It means joint participation and intimate fellowship. It means community, but more than that, it means communion. But it also means generous sharing, mutual generous sharing and unity of purpose. From the scriptural perspective, koinonia results from the living Christ joining with the community of faithful disciples through the Holy Spirit's ministry for God's redemptive purpose. Douglas John Hall describes it as the community which is being brought to live the representative life of Christ in the world. Jerome O'Connor goes on to observe, the church differs from all other human groupings insofar as its unity is not functional but organic. Its members are not merely united by a common purpose but share a common existence. What is that common existence? It's being 
a new creation in Christ. Or better yet, it's being a new creation in Christ altogether. Several years ago, I was invited to baptize three people in Coldwater, Michigan. Fortunately, there was some warm water in cold water. <laughs> is anybody here from Coldwater, Michigan? Or do you know where it is? Having that experience was such a blessing. It was a mutual celebration of three precious older adults experiencing new life in Christ through the ministries of that congregation. Joy flooded my soul as they talked to me excitedly about feeling fully welcomed and included in the faith community. The congregation embodied the gospel through its bold relational outreach and Christ-like hospitality. We need many more congregations like that. Jean Vanier, the recipient of the 2003 Community of Christ International Peace Award, stated in his book, Community and Growth, that congregations should pray regularly to receive the spiritual gift of welcome. The spiritual gift of welcome. He described that gift as the Holy Spirit's energy of peace working in community formation. As vital as they are, Christ's vision for the church is not limited, though, to individual congregations. Community of Christ is called to be a worldwide faith movement pursuing a worldwide mission. According to Ephesians chapter 2, the gospel is God in Christ breaking down walls of human division and hostility. God's purpose in the gospel is to create, and I quote, one new humanity, thus making peace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. You see, this is a broad vision of salvation, reconciliation, and peace that goes way beyond individual salvation for some people. The gospel aims for the reconciliation of genders and tribes and classes and cultures and, and nations. The church is called to embody what one new humanity in Christ looks like as an alternative to human divisions and hostilities. Community of Christ is not some loose network of congregations pursuing their own interests. That perspective falls far short of the inspired vision that birthed the church. The Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, paragraph 4, sounds the overarching call of the church with these words, and I quote, that faith might increase in the earth. The church began with a vision of mission 
to the whole world. One remarkable aspect of community of Christ for me is that experience of oneness in Christ locally and globally at the same time. It's not either or, it's both. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church. I felt that oneness recently at the congregation my family attends, Colonial Hills, as we shared in communion. A soloist was singing, How Beautiful. The refrain of Twyla Paris's song, How Beautiful, goes like this. How beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. And as I watched the communion being served and listened to the song, I sensed the Holy Spirit working to weave people into something more than just a meeting of members and friends. A portion of words of counsel came to mind. Oneness and equality in Christ are realized through the waters of baptism, confirmed by the Holy Spirit, and sustained through the sacrament of communion. Embrace the full meaning of these sacraments and be spiritually joined in Christ as never before. Yes, I thought, it's happening right here, right now. But being joined in Christ is more than deepening relationships with those we know well and see regularly. I experience the same deep spiritual bond when I travel throughout the worldwide church. The church is never limited to the walls of any church building or the confines of any town or nation. I will never forget the huge crowd from different villages, tribes, and castes that gathered in India during the Golden Jubilee 50th anniversary of the church there. Just before I stood to preach to an estimated 12 to 14,000 people, about three times the capacity of this auditorium. I just began to gaze out over the entire crowd. Not everyone could fit inside. And from time to time, I paused to look into individual faces. And as I did, the Holy Spirit bore undeniable witness of how the gospel of Christ, through the witness and ministries of community of Christ, was bringing ministry, breaking down walls of division, and creating a people of oneness in Christ. And I felt such a strong relational bond of love and belonging with all of those who were gathered. Some of the earliest Christian churches saw the true nature of the church that way. I quote from Clark Williamson in his book, Way of Blessing, Way of Life, the early churches were lured by the vision and the reality of a new kind of communal life, 
a life of communion with God, Christ, and one another, a life in which there was no Greek, no barbarian, no slave, no free, no male, no female, but all were one in Christ. In his book, 30 Years That Changed the World, Michael Green describes the early Christian community by highlighting the quality of their fellowship and their sacrificial love for one another. It's hard for us to recognize the depth of that fellowship, he writes. We have no idea today what it means to embrace a slave owner and a slave. We can hardly have any conception of the barriers of pride and prejudice that separated Greek and barbarian. Yet both were to be found in the new society in which Jesus broke down every barrier. We call ourselves a people of the restoration. I wonder if we fully comprehend what it would mean to restore the oneness and equality in Christ characteristic of some of the earliest Christian churches. I quote again from Clark Williamson in his book, Way of Blessing, Way of Life. The church testifies to God's purpose of bringing blessing and well-being to all of God's creation. Hence, the church is called to overcome in its own life all the obstructions of ethnicity, class, race, and gender that tear at the fabric of human community. Community of Christ is answering that call. Decisions made in recent history to be more inclusive are faithful to how the earliest Christian communities lived the gospel. The words of counsel we will consider at this conference emphasize Christ's call to further embody our oneness and equality in Christ. Our witness is needed desperately today. In many places, people are withdrawing from each other. Those deemed different are being unjustly blamed and scapegoated for society's ills. Walls of fear, hostility, and hate torn down by Jesus Christ are being rebuilt. Community of Christ is called to an alternative vision of life together that reconciles human divisions. Call it Zion, call it the blessings of community. We are called to be a people who do all we can to bend the future toward realization of God's vision of peace on and for the earth. And we are told in scripture that the whole creation waits with eager longing for the coming of such a people. Are we such a people? The Holy Spirit summons to the church today through the words of counsel is 
be passionately concerned about forming inclusive communities of love, oneness, and equality that reveal divine nature. What does that word inclusive really mean? Usually it means all-encompassing. In the context of church life, it also means the worth and dignity of each person is upheld. All are offered the same opportunity to experience the transforming power of the gospel to make them new creations in Christ. But being inclusive does not mean just anything goes in the church's life. Earlier, when speaking of the call to the church to be inclusive, I quoted from Williamson, the true meaning of being inclusive is that the church may not prohibit from its life any of the God-given diversity of the human family. In the same paragraph, Williamson points out, but the false meaning of being inclusive is that the church must be equally open to and affirming of whatever values or ideas may be floating around in the culture. That is called relativism. The gospel of Jesus Christ does have certain points of view. That distinction is difficult for some to accept, especially those from Western cultures. In his massive book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor analyzes the accelerating advance of secularism in Western cultures and Western Christianity. This secular age, as he calls it, includes a cultural bias that gives priority to the, quote, individual. Simply put, this mindset claims that in most any matter, there is no truth beyond what an individual decides is good for them. It also asserts that any human group is just an assortment of autonomous individuals. That trend is idolatry because it enthrones the, quote, individual as the center of the universe rather than God. That's not the community of Christ way. In true Christian community, major consideration is given to how individual beliefs and lifestyles impact the overall health and values and well-being of others in the community. To paraphrase the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, I may be free to do many things, but if what I do confuses a brother or sister, and causes them to stumble, I will not do it. Christ-like love, as seen in Christ's sacrifice for all, prefers the well-being of others. Consider the direction in Doctrine and Covenants 164.6 about principles of moral behavior and relationships. 
These principles now affirmed by the church through World Conference action begin with the worth and giftedness of all people and protect the most vulnerable. They continue with, and I quote, Christ-like love, mutual respect, responsibility, justice, covenant, and faithfulness. The majority of those principles have to do with just moral relationships in the church community and society. As the one called to bring this counsel to the church, I assure you these principles carry certain meanings, certain implications, and boundaries. Not just any behavior can fit into them. The challenge for healthy church community is to adamantly affirm the worth of all people without necessarily affirming the values, habits, and lifestyles of all people. Oneness in Christ does not mean that we uniformly agree on all beliefs, official statements, and policies. We certainly have demonstrated that in recent decades as we have endeavored to resolve increasingly difficult questions. And so I return to my original point. Oneness in Christ is about koinonia, the depth and quality of our relationships in Christ. Oneness in Christ means that no matter how strongly we hold different views, we retain them with respect and goodwill toward others. It also means, and it especially means, we understand it is not human effort that ultimately binds us together in spiritual community. We are called to such community. It is Christ who brings us together and holds us together for divine purposes. Christ gathers us into community in the sure embrace of love, a love whose invitation extends to all, whose endurance waits for all things, and whose strength holds all things together. May we go into the future with faith and confidence in that promise. On Saturday morning, during the closing worship, I will speak more about our calling as a people. And I will offer my sense of God's direction for the next phases of our journey as a people of restoration. Continuing revelation assures us God is involved in the life and mission of the church always birthing a future of hope and promise. With that thought, I will close tonight 
with the following excerpt from recent words of counsel. Beloved community of Christ, do not just speak and sing of Zion. Live, love, and share as Zion. Those who strive to be visibly one in Christ, among whom there are no poor or oppressed. Amen.